like we're acculturated to believe that if you're accused of a crime, that like you're like you're the accused, you're a defendant. Like you're not Ian, you're not Thomas, you're just like like you're you're a crime, you know. And something that like I always ask, you know, in jury selection is do you think that just because someone got arrested that they must have done something wrong? Because like growing up, I remember like watching TV shows like Cops um, and like or like Law and Order and like everyone, like all the TV shows, all the media, everything is all centered around like prosecuting people. And of course, the, the guy who's being arrested is being, you know, the guy that Ice-T arrested in SVU. Of, of course, he's like he's a he's a terrible guy. And like, he's, is he going to get away? No, he's never going to. They're never going to get away with it because they're all bad guys. And kind of like by extension, we start to think that everyone who's accused of a crime is is somehow bad. And and I and I just don't think that's the case. Today, I'm absolutely honored to welcome Thomas Leaf, a dedicated Connecticut public defender, to our show. Thomas brings a unique perspective to our discussion on the criminal justice system. In this enlightening and thought-provoking conversation, we'll explore his motivations for choosing the path of a public defender over private practice, gain insight into the realities of his role, and delve into the crucial improvements needed within the criminal justice system and more. It promises to be an eye-opening and insightful discussion with an active public defender. This episode is brought to you by my friends over at findagreatattorney.com. If you are injured anywhere in the country, just visit findagreatattorney.com, a free service that can find you one of the best lawyers in your area. You focus on getting better, and they'll do the rest. Big thank you to findagreatattorney.com for sponsoring this episode. And guys, if you enjoy the Locked In podcast, remember to please leave us a review on Apple or Spotify and also subscribe to the Ian Bick YouTube channel. It does us wonders and help boost the show out to more people. Now, I hope you guys sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Thomas Lee. Thomas, welcome to Locked In, man. It's a pleasure to have you. You're our first public defender <laughs> on the show. I'm actually, I'm looking forward to this. I got some great questions. Uh, I think it's going to be a really thought-provoking conversation. And, you know, when you walked in here uh, a couple weeks ago, yeah. I think I definitely recognized you from when I used to go through the court oh, system. Because, <laughs> you know, you see the same, um, like, uh, lawyers, prosecutors mm -hmm. at that courthouse mm -hmm. in Danbury all mm -hmm. the time. Um, so I knew you looked familiar. Uh, I think it's something along those lines. I think, you know, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I, It's funny— like, I know a lot of people in the criminal defense bar who are, like, you would consider, like, just superstar lawyers. And I never would even imagine myself anywhere near that bracket. I just think of myself as just, like, I go to work, I have a job, and I'm just trying to do the best I can. Um, but, like, before we get started, I just have to say I am still a member of the public defender division. But um, I just want to make sure it's clear that, like, I'm here just as, like, Speaking for myself, I'm not here as a representative of anyone, um, you know, just just so like I'm not here as a representative of the Connecticut Public Defender Division, but I've been, uh, I guess what you would call a career public defender uh, for going on, let's see, I've been in the division now for like 12 years now. Um, it's virtually my entire career has been criminal defense law. I had a small um, time where I was in private practice. Um, did some civil law stuff, but my entire career has basically been centered around criminal defense, particularly criminal defense for indigent clients, which is, you know, public defender work. Um, so I don't know if, where we want to get started. Well, well let's you, start from the top. How, okay. how do you even get into law? How do you become a lawyer? So I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer until my second year of law school, um, which is a funny thing to say. People always kind of look at me funny. Uh, I, um, I, so my father is an attorney. Uh, he was a lawyer and he's kind of like elder statesman status in the New Haven uh, County Bar Association. Like everyone knows my dad, Freddie the Leaf. Like he's, uh, been doing, um, uh, he's a general practitioner. He's been working on his own for now. Jeez. I mean, for as long as I've been alive. Uh, but he got his start. He was a uh, he went to law school through ROTC 
uh, and was stationed in the army as a JAG lawyer. Uh, he was stationed in Korea. Uh, that's where he met my mom. Um, I always joke and say that I'm a product of uh, American foreign policy because my, my, my dad was stationed in Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he was stationed in Germany where he worked both on as on the prosecutorial side and on the defense side. Like in the army, it's kind of like – it's like after you finish like a rotation, they'll like flip you. They'll be like, you're like, all right, this, this rotation, you're going to be a prosecutor. Next rotation, you're going to be a defense lawyer. So my father, uh, when, he, when he started his career in the military – uh, he was literally just given a stack of files and said, okay, you're going to trial on these 10 files in three hours. Have fun. You know, and that, and that was like the, that was like the UCMJ criminal military justice kind of system, which is like totally different than, than the civil system, like, or the, the civilian system, if you will. Um, my sister was born when he was stationed in uh, Nuremberg in Bomberg, Germany. Uh, came back from there and uh, worked for the city of New Haven as a corporation counsel, uh, was partnered a few times, worked for a couple different firms. But as far as I can remember, my memory of my father has always been that he's been a sole practitioner, which is really rare these days. You don't see too many guys like him who have like a general kind of purpose, like if you need a will, if you get a DUI, if you got into a car accident, like Freddie could help you out in all of these different things. So I had an older sister, uh, and we can get into her uh, if you like to. Um, but for a while as a kid, it was kind of like this whole thing that my sister was going to go to law school and and join my dad and be leaf and leaf. Like that was like their dream. And I was like, you guys are crazy. Like being a lawyer, it sounds really lame. You got to wear a suit every day. It doesn't look like any fun. Um, who wants to go to law school? I just was like, um, for the longest time for my entire childhood and people to this day still tell me that like, I should have gone to art school. Um, (laughs) it's like, you know, I, I I don't know. I don't know how to respond. I'm like, well, it's a little bit late for that. But, um, you know, and it kind of got reversed where my sister was the one who became an artist, um, until she passed away in this like freak accident when I was 20. And then, um, when I was going th- – I was in college when this happened and I was on track to becoming a high school teacher. And and I was still shying away from the idea of going out and going to like like going to art school and pursuing what like, you know, everyone like will always say like if there's anything anyone ever associated with me growing up, it was uh, I always carried a sketchbook everywhere I went. And even to this day, like it's in my car. Like I carry a sketchbook everywhere I go and – um, you know, I'll go to a coffee shop, draw, and that's just something that's always been a part of who I am. It's like one of like my like happy places. Um, you know, and when teaching didn't work out, like, cause I just, I wasn't happy. Like I felt good about the work because I was teaching at Wilbercross high school and the kids were awesome. Like I loved the kids. Like they were, they made me feel good about what I, about what I was doing but I just didn't feel accomplished or good at it. Like, I just didn't feel like I was a good teacher. And that's a career where if you are not 110% into it, you got to get out. You got to make room for someone else who is. It's not fair to the kids. It's not like it, you're not you're, you're like you, especially if you're aware of that. Um, so <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, I told you the story off camera um, when I was – When I was teaching, I had a student whose father was a police officer who my father knew for a very long time, and his name's Billy White. And everyone knows who Billy – and Billy just passed away, I think, maybe about a year or two ago. Um, And he was like a complicated guy if you look into him. Like he was a really – he's like kind of like cult – like local celebrity kind of hero in the New Haven area. Um, But he got federally indicted for, you know, corruption – and, and for doing things that he wasn't supposed to be doing. But Billy knew me <clears throat> and he knew my father. And one of his kids was a student of mine um, who I believe is a police officer now. Um, great kid. Like, you know, she was one of my favorite students. Um, and I remember her to this day. She was always very like a, a good natured, good head on her shoulder, smart kid. Um, and 
I remember talking to Billy about it. I was like, Billy, you know, I don't think teaching's for me. I'm thinking about becoming a cop. And he's like, absolutely. Come on, like, you know, like you'll just put your paperwork in, your New Haven will hire you. I'll like I'll I'll vouch for you. You're good to go. Two, three weeks later, he gets federally indicted. Oh wow, that was quick. <laughs> and, and I was like, and my father looked at me, he's like, maybe this is a sign that maybe going into law enforcement's not for you. And I was like, Yeah. He's like, why don't you go to like you ever consider going to law school? And I was like, I guess I just didn't know what to do. I had no direction. So it's like, you know, I I I ended up going to Quinnipiac for law school. Um, and I originally went to law school thinking that I was going to become a prosecutor. Like that was my initial like idea. Like, oh, all right, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a police officer. I'm going to be a prosecutor. Um, and my father was kind of like, all right, that's what if like, you know, he always, Fred always said to me, he, he always said to me, I'm not here to make your decisions. I'm here to support them. You know, and that's something I say to my son to this day. You know, I'm not here to decide anything for you. I'm just here to like decide, like help, like whatever makes you happy, whatever thing you want to, whatever you want to go, whatever direction you want to go in. Like I want to do whatever I can to help enable that for you. Um, so I interned in the uh, state's attorney's office and it was a very good experience, but I knew immediately that I was not built for that kind of work. I was just like, yeah, no, this is not where I belong. Um, this is, I'm glad I did this because I realized that uh, my outlook, you know, the way I see things um, just didn't, I would not have made an effective state's attorney. Um, and I don't think I would have been happy doing that job either. So that brought me to interning in the public defender's office over in New Haven, J uh, J.D., Connecticut divides their their court system into it's a bifurcated system. So you have geographic area courts and you have judicial district courts. So like Danbury is a combined JDGA and we don't have like separate GAs in this area. New Haven, however, does. So like New Haven JD covers Meriden GA7 and it also covers New Haven GA23, which used to be like a couple of different like geographic areas, but it's basically like New Haven County. So JD court is like or high court or part a in, in the criminal side of things you'll hear it referred to as part a that's where um like all the serious felonies are so i was interning in the part a office in new haven um and that's where i met a guy named tom ullman uh tom ullman uh is perhaps like one of my biggest inspirations next to my dad as an attorney um he is you know it's if you talk about tom ullman in 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 a um, criminal defense circles and in, in the land, everyone knew who Tom was. Um, and again, this is a guy who um, was like, I knew him since I was a little kid because I, I grew up in the same neighborhood in Westville. Like I grew up in Westville, New ha the Westville section of New Haven, which is like a pretty like upper middle class affluent you know neighborhood. Um, like I grew up like in a, like a very like a fairly wealthy family. Like I was very lucky, very fortunate growing up. Um, and Tom, I don't know if you're familiar with him or not. Have you ever seen a picture of him? Um, but he has this like everyone knows knows him because he had, he had the way he wore his beard. It was like this like chin strap kind of Abe Lincoln kind of style <laughs> beard, right? Um, and and I always like knew him in the neighborhood. But I never I didn't know him. I didn't know what he did until I actually interned in his office and got to see him work. And that's where I was like, this is the kind, this is where I belong. Like it took a while for me to figure out, but this is doing this kind of work, working with indigent clients, um, you know, standing up for people that no one else wants to stand up for, uh, was something that I was like, that is something I can get excited about. That is something that I, I feel good to do. To me, it's a privilege to do it. Um, and he was a tremendous practitioner in the courtroom um, but he was also just like what he was probably best known for. And I speak of him in the past tense because he tragically passed away like right after he retired. It was like one of those things where like, like this was a guy who worked on the Cheshire home invasion case. Uh, this is a guy who has done just tons, of, like before Connecticut abolished the death penalty, um, he was handling like all the serious capital cases in New Haven, in like New Haven JD. Um, had done the job for a very long time. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, he started off, I think, as a, an investigator um, and, like, you know, paid his way through law school. And that was a guy who, like, from the very beginning, from the very outset, he was going to do public defender work. Uh, and I just thought he was an amazing human being. Uh, everyone in that office, all the lawyers in that office, like he, he had, he had like attracted really good, uh, professional attorneys who were excellent practitioners, but also excellent human beings. Um, you know, I think one of the things that, that I learned from him was that like, as important as it is to represent your client and make sure that their rights are being respected, that the state's being held to their burden, one of the most important things for him was to make sure that everyone saw his client, no matter what they were accused of, as a human being with dignity. Um, and that was like one of the most important lessons I learned from him. Um, and that's something I take with me. Like that's something I, I – like I have like a, like a photograph of him from his memorial service. Like next to my – it's like up there with like my family pictures in my office. Um, so I, I interned for him. Um, and that's where I was like, you know, I don't want to be a lawyer. I want to be a public defender. You know, like if I wasn't in public defender services, if I wasn't doing, um, criminal defense work for indigent clients, I probably wouldn't be in law. I probably would be in a completely different sector doing something else. Um, <clears throat> because I, that's, that's just how I feel about the job. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's something that I'm immensely proud of. And it's something I feel good about. And when I first started, I had these like ideas like, oh, I'm going to get on the capital defense unit. I'm going to do all these like serious cases. And I'm going to do all these like, I want like, you know, <clears throat> give me like all the like, you know, like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the really big, huge, you know, cases that get headlines and things like that. Now I like my, I think where I, where I think you, I mean, I don't want to act like there's like a value judgment here that like some cases are better than others. But one of the things I, I still get the such tremendous fulfillment out is just helping like a regular person get back on their feet. You know, like when I think like there was um one of your prior prior guests, I forget her name, but she was a social worker. Uh, the clinical psychologist. Yeah. Yeah. The clinic or clinical social worker. Yeah. 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 She and was she, great. She worked in a hospital. I believe, or a prison hospital. Yeah, she works at a couple juvenile and um, men, uh, mental health ones yeah. and, and a few. So the way she described her clients, I was like, those are the people that I work with. You know, those are the people that, that like, I have as, you know, that that's, that's like, you know, he, like, you know, I, I really, what she said about, like, these people who are, come from a, from places where, like, just everything is stacked against them. You know, and everything is like they're like, you know, I was born with so many privileges, right? I was born into a home where I didn't have to worry about where my next meal was coming from. I didn't have to worry about whether or not, you know, my parents had too much to drink that day. I didn't have to worry about any like I was safe. I was well cared for. I was loved. I was supported. And, and not only that, I, I was told that I was like constantly, I was, it was reinforced that I was worthy. Like I was a worthy person. Like I, I was someone that, um, meant something. And I think one of the things that I struggle that I see people in this sector and that, that, the, you know, and it, and it kind of like, if you zoom out and look at like the criminal defense system or criminal law system, uh, you know, as a whole, you know, we can get into like different kind of like, you know, I don't know, what's the, the word I'm looking for? Um, it, it's like, like we're acculturated to believe that if you're accused of a crime, that like you're like, you're the accused, you're a defendant, like you're not Ian, you're not Thomas, you're just like, like you're, you're a crime, you know? And something that like I always ask, you know, in jury selection is do you think that just because someone got arrested that they must have done something wrong? Because like growing up, I remember like watching TV shows like Cops, um, and like or like Law and Order, and like everyone, like all the TV shows, all the media, everything is all centered around like prosecuting people. And of course, the the guy who's being arrested is being 
you know, the guy that Ice T arrested in SVU. Of, of course, he's like he's a he's a terrible guy, and like he's, is he going to get away? No, he's never going. They're never going to get away with it because we're all bad guys. And kind of like by extension, we start to think that everyone is accused of a crime is is somehow bad. And and I and I just don't think that's the case. Sorry to interrupt today's episode, everyone, but I need to tell you about Find a Great Attorney. It's a great service revolutionizing the way injured parties find one of the best personal injury attorneys in their area. I've known the founder, Richard Hastings, for a long time, and I'm really impressed with his abilities as a lawyer and how he really cares about his clients. Accidents can happen to anyone, leaving you not knowing what to do or where to turn. Most people don't know how to go about finding a top-rated lawyer. Findagreatattorney.com can connect you to one of the best lawyers in your area. Have peace of mind knowing you're in the hands of a lawyer that can help maximize the amount of money you can get for your case. Findagreatattorney.com relieves the aggravation of finding a highly regarded attorney for any type of accident in any state. All you need to do is fill out their brief online form, and they can get to work finding you a highly rated lawyer in your area. The best part is there's no cost for their service, and the lawyers they refer you to only get paid if they win your case. You don't have to come up with any money out of your own pocket to hire one of the best attorneys in your area. Don't take a chance and hire a lawyer that will not properly represent you. Visit findagreatattorney.com, fill out their brief online form, and let them do the rest. The strength of your lawyer might very well determine how much money you are able to get for your case. Now let's get back into my interview with Thomas Leaf. And there's now, there's even more than ever, there's two parts to that now too. You have that aspect and then you have the part where say they were found guilty or they did take a plea deal and then they come out and mm-hmm. now they're, they have this burden of being labeled as a felon and people yeah. associate that with being a bad person. I mean, we yeah. were talking the other day just because of my past, people mm-hmm. associate that with me being a bad person, but mm-hmm. they never gave me a chance and I'm yeah. a lot different than what the news media has made me out to be in, in some cases. And I, what I think is that there should be like a follow-up article about every individual that gets out because mm-hmm. there's the one side painted of them before getting arrested or mm-hmm. after getting arrested or getting convicted. But when they get out, there's no there's no second article. Yeah. Like if yeah. you searched Ian Bick Danbury, there's not one positive yeah. article yeah. For, for, for years, yeah. you know? And yeah. and it's beyond just my situation. It's just in general, there should be some follow up to what that person's doing. Yeah, and and I, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, when you invited me onto the show, um, I like you know, I mean, first of all, on the one hand, I'm like, why me? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> the joke I always say to people is like, I'm not even a real lawyer. I'm just a public defender. Um, you know, but like, you know, the, I I think that you know. You know, I, I think it's okay for the, the audience to know is like how we met each other. Um, and it was through AJ, I think, is how we— AJ Galante. Yeah, yeah. AJ Galante. He was on the show, who's, too. He was on the show. Mm-hmm. And I and it's funny. I knew—I've I like I've seen the Netflix documentary about AJ and his family. And, like, I grew up in New Haven. So coming to Danbury, Danbury is like this, like, odd little microcosm in Connecticut— <laughs> It's like its own state within Connecticut. So it's just such a different place than what I'm used to growing up. But I knew about AJ um, long before I ever met the guy. Uh, I watched the Netflix documentary about the Danbury Trashers. And I had heard, like, you know, at working at the courthouse, you'd, like his name would come up once in a while. Um, and your name would come up as well. You know, I, I think, like, um, you know, and, and people always, you know, and, you know, I, I, I think AJ. Uh, I started taking my son to go to his his place to go box, and AJ's like, "You got to like get your son back into you know podcasting or you know doing his YouTube channel," and 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 I think that's how he connected you know you to him, and you know everyone who knows me knows that I would not want my son associated with anyone who I didn't think was you know a safe person for him to be around, and I think that like you know. By looking at your platform and looking at the thesis of all the guests that you've ever had on, it's always about that, like, like you can always turn it around. You can always get back up. You know, it's like the, the cliche in boxing. It's not how many times you get knocked down. It's how many times you get back up. Um, and that really spoke to me, you know, because I've seen, like, there are other, 
you know, platforms, other podcasts, other places that that talk to people who have gone to prison. And a lot of them are like interesting war stories about what prison life is like. And a lot of them are, you know, some of them like sensationalize it in, in ways that I kind of like, eh, okay, I get it. You're, you're, you're trying to like sell a product basically. But I think, you know, the common theme throughout all the different episodes I've seen, you know, on Locked In um, that I really appreciated was that um, it's not just about what got you locked up, but how did you try to pick, put the pieces back together again once you got out? Because it's not like, you know, a person's life, does, a defendant's life doesn't end once they're sentenced. Like the, and like the case isn't over when a person's sentenced, you know, particularly if that person has to go in and do, a, do some time. Um, and that's like something I think I feel like people don't understand like how traumatically, like traumatically life altering that experience is. Um, it's, it, people don't understand how like it's, it's almost like, I don't know if it's a good analogy to say it's like being like sent away to war, but it's like, it changes you. It's, 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 it's something that, that, you know, you have to do a lot of work on yourself to kind of like pick yourself back up and put yourself back out there. And you're always going to have that scarlet letter on you. Like people are always going to judge you based on what they saw in the media or what they heard about, or this is just knowing about the fact that like, oh, that person's got a, got a conviction. Um, that's something that, you know, follows you for the rest of your life, you know? And I think it's something where, you know, what do I, what's the nature of my job? It's trying to advocate for people who deserve a second chance, you know, or, or people who deserve some sort of consideration or people who, you know, who aren't the sum of their worst choices, you know, that they are people who are still worthy of, you know, you know, being thought like everyone should be treated with some level of dignity and humanity. Um, even the people who were accused of the worst crimes possible, you know, people always ask me like, you know, I, cause yeah, you get assigned cases of people like crimes against children, right? That's always the first thing people always, whenever I say to someone like what I do for a living, they're like, how could you represent those people? Um, and, and it's, it's like easy. Like on the one hand, how you, tr how you, how you represent or how the system treats, you know, the, tr the system has to treat everybody in a, like, it's not a right if it's only for certain people who have some sort of like privilege. Um, you know, the system can't just pick and choose who the constitution applies to. Um, and you know, and the, and on the, on the one hand too, everyone was someone's child at one point. You know, everyone was like everyone, even the people who are accused of the most heinous things, you know, whether they're guilty or not guilty, everybody was someone like that person was born and that was like, they were someone's child, you know, they were someone's baby. Like someone looked at them and was like, oh my God, that's like, that's my kid. They, they you know, that might, like they might not have been able to, you know, vocalize it or act on it, but um, you know, I don't know if that makes sense. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah. and that's what our show does is, is basically, you know, humanize each individual because we start at their childhood mm -hmm. and, and we, and you can see that the person that wasn't convicted mm -hmm. is not so different than the person that was and, and yeah. fell into a, a addiction and prison and whatnot. Like we all start at the same spot. Yeah. Um, we grow up differently, but we're all at that beginning starting point. And the importance here for you today is you're you defend these individuals that come on our show. You, you're the representative, so yeah. it's so important, you know, to hear your your take on it and, and side of it. Yeah, I, I, you know, and again, I still feel like what I do is I'm very fortunate to have the career that I have. Even though, like, if people ask me, like, if you could go back and go to art school, like, if you could, if if you could say you could go back to like when you had to apply to college. Rather than going to school and becoming an English teacher, would you have rather gone back and do, um, gone back and gone to like, I don't know, CalArt or RISD or any other like, you know, you know, SV, like, uh, was it School of Visual Arts in New York? All the places I thought about going as a kid. Um, 
would you go back and do it over again and do, do things differently? And I think, honestly, I would say no. You know, like, even though, like, art is a huge part of my life and who I am, and it's something that people associate with me, um, I'm always constantly drawing. I've always, like, one of the, like, I've always wanted to, like, produce my own comic book or, or illustrate my own novel or put out an animated film or something like that. That's something I've always wanted to do. And even if I was given the opportunity to go back and make a different decision that would lead me down the path where I could have done that, I still think I would want to go and do, take the road that I, that got me here to where I am because I think it's important work. Like, I think it's something that like I am immensely proud of. I think of guys like Tom Ullman, you know, like those, those are the people who like, if, if, if he's wherever he is now and he looks at me and says, you've done a good job, like that would give me so much satisfaction or, or knowing that like, you know, like, you know, that like, like th that would make all the diff that would make such a huge difference to me, you know, or, I mean, I don't know. I said that really inarticulately <laughs> here, really inartfully. <laughs> yeah. You know, like I'm, I'm paid. Uh, it, it's funny. It's like, a. What do you do for a living? You talk. Like that's basically my. <laughs> well, that's my job now too. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get to interview people. So so um, yeah, and I and and I I hope I'm I'm, I'm a good interviewee. I get um, no anyone that's willing to talk and speak is great. You know, <laughs> it's the people that don't uh, take a little bit to open up that are a little bit harder work. But once they get comfortable and in action and everything and, and, you know, cause it's just me and the guest in a room. There's, there's no yeah, one else and yeah. it's comfortable. We make it comfortable. Yeah. No. And you're an easy guy to hang out with. <laughs> I'm glad you think that. <laughs> I know. Like my, my, my son, um, you know, he really likes you. It's like, Good. it's, it's, it's adorable. Like, you know, he's like, I, I think the last time we were, you know, working on his stuff, he's like, we're going to go see Ian today. Right. And I was <laughs> like, and, and I think like a lot of people would be like, are you sure you want your kid hanging out with him? And I'm like, yeah, why not? Why not? Like, you know, he's like, like, like everyone's got a past, right? Like every person you ever dated had an ex, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like everybody's made and, and like, are, have we all like, is like, show me someone who's never made a mistake. Show me someone who has never um, made a poor choice, you know, or, or made a series of poor choices. Um, you know, I think the question then becomes, what do you do? What do you do with that at that point? You know, like, what do you, like, what do you do after you've realized that you've made poor choices or, or you, you know, did things that you wouldn't, that you're ashamed of or wouldn't normally do now? If you reflect on it and you think about it and you internalize it and you learn from it and you grow from it, um, you know, that's, that's the goal, right? I mean, like the, one of the things I love about my job is that, I am constantly in a position where I can evolve as a human being. You know, when I think about my outlook and how I saw the things when I, how I saw things when I first got into criminal defense law, um, you know, I started off going to law school wanting to be a cop and now I'm like anything but, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm like completely on the opposite end of things. And, and I think that like, not that I think law enforcement isn't a worthy pursuit. I think that that is something if, if that's your calling, if that's where you feel you can do the best work that you can for your fellow human being, then, you know, again, I'm not here to make your decisions. I'm here to support them. You know, and I would say that to anyone that I met, you know, it's like, look, man, you got to decide what, what is, what's, what's the path you want to walk. Well, then make sure you can walk it with your head held high. You know, like that, that's, you know, and that, and that's, I would say that to, me, if I was talking to me when I was 18 years old, who was scared to go to art school, like the one, like the, the people always say, like, there's, uh, there's, um, there's another attorney who is a guy I've always looked up to. And I use one of my old supervisors, a guy named John Walkley. Um, and he's still in the division too. He's a fantastic lawyer, wonderful human being. He always said to me, you know, Thomas, I think you missed your calling. Every time you'd see me, like, I'd be like in court waiting for my cases to call and I doodle. And I'm like drawing like little like, you know, stuff on my notes waiting for my cases. And he's like, man, I really think you missed your calling. And I was like, like, I think, you know, I don't think I did. 
You know, I think I, I think that there's, you know, I think that, um, cause again, there's something that I, that there's something that I get from the work that I do from working with the people that I do, um, you know, where, you know, you can really help someone get through a really terrible time or a really difficult time, um, you know, or you can help someone get connected to services, gain insight, grow, you know, like one of the things that I love about my job is that um, I learn a tremendous amount about myself from the people that I work with and the people that I represent. Um, you know, there are like, like I'm continually humbled because you're supposed to be as the attorney, whatever field you're in, you're supposed to be the expert. You're supposed to be the person that the client goes to for advice. You're supposed to counsel them and tell them this is what you should do. This is what's in your best interest. These are what the consequences that could happen if you choose to do this or if you choose to do that. Um, and I think a lot of attorneys get lost in the idea that of, um, you know, they don't like being told what to do. Like they don't, they don't like having like their mistakes highlighted to them or they don't like, um, they don't like, like it when, uh, their blind spots are kind of exposed. Whereas for me, I think that just makes me a better lawyer. I think that makes me a better lawyer. It makes me a better human being. And I'm really grateful that I can work in a field that, you know, permits me to continually evolve, continually grow as a human being. And one of the things that is, um, I get to, I get to practice compassion every day. You know, I get to, I have to remind myself that these are not docket numbers. These are not charges. These are not like the accused. These are human beings, human beings who depend on me, you know, and Maybe they don't say the nicest things to me, but that's fine. Like, I don't, like, I'm not, like, like I'm not looking to be um, exalted or treated in a certain way uh, because I'm lucky to be where I am, you know, and I want to be in a position where I can at least try and give back to, you know, to, to the people that I, that I encounter. Or, you know, my father used to always say to me, if you can leave a place better than how you found it, you know, and everyone says that it's like, you know, like I, I want to attribute like, like as a Freddie is like, you know, Confucius or something, but it's like, yeah. you know, I mean, that's a, that's something that everyone, you know, here is you know, leave, leave the place better than how you found it. Um, I work in a field that allows me, that, that gives me the opportunity to do that. Um, and I'm just always going to be grateful for that. Now, the way you just described how you look at cases and individuals. Do you mm -hmm. think there's a common ground for prosecutors to look at it at that same level? Because from a former inmate's perspective, mm -hmm. I think a lot of us feel like the prosecutors are just looking at it as another docket number or another deal to be made and not, not as an individual human. You know, it, people run in, there's always like this kind of trap where, People think like there is some sort of like um, like a conspiratorial aspect on the state side of things, um, you know, and and like are there states attorneys who I know who are who do practice compassion? Yeah, absolutely. I do like I do like, you know, because it, it's like I, I do know them. I do work alongside them. And part of like the gig as a criminal defense attorney in any in any like attorney really um the one your one stock in trade like the one thing that you have that once you lose you really can't get back is your credibility and and i think that like you know you want to be able to make sure that when when you say something to a judge or you say something to a state's attorney that they take that and they say to themselves okay thomas told me this and thomas always tells me the truth right or or you know, I want to make sure that whenever I'm representing something to anyone, whether it's a, a state's attorney or whether it's a judge, um, that I that my credibility is something that that carries weight. Um, you know, and I think state's attorneys feel the same way. You know, they need to know they they need to feel as though um, that you know it's something where I mean, it's I don't know. I would say most of the most of the people that I know, I, I don't see them as being cruel or callous. Um, and I think it's easy to kind of, you know, if it's 
if there is a stereotype about criminal defense lawyers and public defenders in particular regarding their like capability and competence, I think there's a similar kind of stereotype with state's attorneys um, of their cruelty and callousness that, you know, I think is sometimes a little unfair, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, you know, cause I know that like people, you know, always will talk to me like, well, you know, tell me, you know, what do you think? Should I get a real lawyer? you know, versus having me as a public defender. And I, and that like used to bother me. Um, and it's not like, you know, that's like, you know, that's, that's the stereotype that we, that we grow up with because of, you know, mass media. Yeah. Where do you think that comes from? That's a great topic uh, to dive into because I know like when I was battling and going through my cases, I yeah. wanted to stay far away from a public defender because yeah. there's that connotation, at least on the state level. Mm -hmm. But then when I got to the federal level, I realize there's this whole like CJA. Federal and, defenders like, are good. Yeah, like my attorney, yeah. um, which you probably know him, Jonathan Einhorn. He's, John he, Einhorn was your yeah, attorney? Yeah, yeah. Oh he's my a God. good friend. That's hilarious. Tell yeah. him I said hi next time you talk to him. Okay. He knows me. And he's got to know your dad, right? He does. He's no. like a sole practitioner in, in, uh, Funny story. in New Haven. John Einhorn bought my parents old house. The house I grew up with, he Whoa. bought for my wow. parents. John's a great guy. I, I grew up with his son. Okay. Yeah, Jeff. Yeah, he, Jeff, who's who I think works in Brooklyn doing criminal defense work. And he federal does defender work. He he did something with the um, he defended uh, El Chapo. He was on the El Chapo. Yeah, that's case. right. That's right. That's right. That is yeah. hilarious. I John believe. just loves the art of trial. I'm like, John, when are you going to retire? Yeah. And he's yeah. like, never. Like, never. I'm yeah. doing this. He drives yeah. around his nice little car. His ass and, is Austin Healy. Yeah, he just, he, like, me. it was me and him battling the feds. Like, yeah. he's just, he shows up at his briefcase. I saw him a few weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, he's just a really good guy. We're going to have him on the show. He, he's That's great, to do it. That's great, man. I, I love that guy. I for Because, you know, it's funny. I always, I w I've been meaning to ask you who represented you and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I've, and it's something I feel like I should have known that, but I, yeah. You know. And Danbury, it was, uh, Jeff Jowdy. Yeah. Um, and then in, um, for federal, it was Einhorn. I just yep. Googled best new, uh, new Haven attorneys. He <laughs> popped up. I filled out his form. He loved the case. Like he was so energetic. He's like, yeah, yeah we're going to trial. Yeah. Um, but he's the one that kind of showed me how it actually works with like the public defenders are actual, like they they come from law firms. It's not like it's a, a their own like public defender yeah. unit. Yeah. So like the, in the CGA panel in the federal system is is not too dissimilar to how um, Connecticut's public defender system is is set up. Um, Connecticut has a really robust public defender system. Like unlike most states, um, in Connecticut, like every courthouse, like I'm at the Danbury JD GA location, but every courthouse has its own public defender services office. And then when you have conflicts, we have assigned counsel who are like the CGA guys. So if like, you know, my father used to do uh, CGA panel work and he complained about it. He was like, he was like, oh gosh, it's like to plead someone out in federal court is like going to high mass. <laughs> you know, it takes 45 minutes to do anything, you know, and that's, you know, and he's like, that's, that's not for me, you know, <laughs> but, but it would be like, if you're on the panel um, and it's not easy to get on the panel, like you have to like have like trial experience. You have to know, like you have to demonstrate that you're competent uh, because they'll have like the feds will do some huge bust and they'll have like 50 guys that they're going to arraign one day. And like the federal defenders can like, you know, they, they, they keep who they believe is that the quote unquote, the heavy. And then all the other guys, like my dad, when he was, you know, I think he was talking to me, like he gets a phone call at like a Tuesday at like 10, 10 30 and like, Hey, we're doing it. You, you like, like you want to do an arraignment at two o'clock at federal court in New Haven? Um, you got a guy who's like a lookout for <laughs> like some more, some like some like some organized crime organization. Um, and in Connecticut, we have assigned counsel who do the same thing. Where if we have like co-defendants, you know, it, we have to refer them out to someone who's a contracted attorney with our office uh, to take over the case, take on the case, and so that that way there's no ethical dilemmas or ethical conflicts. It's like it's a requirement. You can't. You can't have one office representing like two co-defendants in one case. Now, is there an advantage from getting the the outsourced attorney that's with a big law firm versus, say, someone that's in the public defender? Like, are they working off the same budget? Is are there constraints? Yeah, I mean, like, like if you're gonna if you're assigned counsel, like when I was in private practice for a while, I did assign counsel work too. And if there was something like I needed my client to get, um, like when I was this was like back when I was in, they, they call it the SPD work or special public defender work, um, if I needed, like, an evaluation done, like, I could go to the division and say, hey, I need to pay for a doctor. My my client can't 
pay for a doctor to do like this evaluation. They would do it. You know, they would like, you know, that's something where, you know, I mean, there's no such thing as enough resources, but access to resources was something that was generally pretty like made available to me when I was doing SPD work if it was needed. I know with John, like we were able to get a private investigator that was all covered under the court system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That was through like the CJA program, yep. which yeah. was awesome. Any Anything like special witnesses, travel, mm -hmm. all of that's mm -hmm. covered under there, yeah. which is really interesting because John's his own attorney. So I thought it was awesome having like an actual – like uh, who had his own law firm. Yep. But I also think at the other end of the spectrum, when you're going up against someone that's big as like the United States government, mm -hmm. it does help to have those big law firms with all the re resources and everything. Mm -hmm. Cause it was literally just me and him against a packed, you know, side, uh, a, a prosecutor side with FBI agents, IRS <laughs> agents and everything. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like if you had that big, bigger law firm too, that, that there could be some advantages. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's one thing, there are a couple of things that money can't buy, and that is credibility and competence. Like there are plenty of big name law firms out there with attorneys working for them that aren't necessarily competent. Um, you know, that's that's something where I think that like, you know, it's funny. I, <laughs> I, th I remember one time this maybe was like a few years ago. Like a someone in private counsel, you know, an attorney comes to me, he's like, What do you think about this offer? And I was like, What are you asking me for? You know, and like, well, you like uh, like he was like inferring like that I somehow that I was like like really like, you know, I had a reputation for being like really good or something. And I was like, Me? You know, like what do you <laughs> what do you want to know my opinion for? Um, you know, and and I think that's just I don't know. That I I it, you're never you know, the joke or the joke with me is that you can't compliment me. I, I, it's impossible. Like I won't, I just won't accept it. Um, so in any time anyone tries to infer that I'm somehow like good at something, it's like imposter syndrome or something, <laughs> I don't know, immediately kicks in and I'm like, you ask him, you know, like yeah. ask that person. Don't ask me like, like ask Jeff Jowdy. <laughs> like there's another guy who I know Jeff very well. Who's probably rutted to at the courthouse yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. Oh yeah. No. And, and, and it's, and it's, um, but I think like people, you know, think that because, I mean, I, again, I go back to a guy like Tom Ullman, um, arguably one of the best criminal defense attorneys I've ever seen, you know, and he was the, he was a public, he was a career public defender. Uh, you know, I, I think probably if you look at like the numbers between people who have private counsel versus people who have like, you know, a public defender attorney, I can't speak for outside Connecticut, um, and and not and again, not that I'm speaking on behalf of anyone other than myself here. Um, I think that there there have been like studies done on like what are like the average results of a case, like uh, you know, in cases and like whether it's plea deals or trial, things like that. Um, and you'll find that you know, public defender attorneys are actually pretty good. <laughs> actually, because I mean, like like they're 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 it's all we do. You know, this is what our main focus is, and. You, you have people who are, who, you know, for the most part want to be there, want that this is a job that they want to do. Like, you know, this isn't like, like, I think, um, you know what I think it is? It's like the thing with the police where mm -hmm. you have one bad apple that kind of tarnishes the rest of it. Yeah. Like when you see something in the news, not every police officer is bad because no. one made mistakes. So like yeah. when you hear about the cases where, uh say uh, any type of attorney botch something well, and the evidence or representation, people kind of blanket assume that they're all bad. And I think I grew up around that stigma too, where it's like, you know, don't, don't get a public defender. Don't do this because of these situations. Yeah. So I, I think that definitely plays a part of it. I, I mean, I would like to try and figure out where that stereotype first started. And I think it probably is from the media. I think it probably is from, um, like, you know, television and mass media, uh, you know, in the way in which, uh, cause I've, I think growing up in all the like criminal procedural shows I've ever seen, I think I've maybe, there's maybe like one show ever made about public defenders, you know, and I don't even remember the name of it. Like that's how great a show it was, <laughs> you know, it's, it's always told like this, the narrative is always told from the state side. 
you know, and, and I, you know, this kind of like reminds me as, as a kid, you know, growing up, like I grew up in New Haven, very privileged, very like, you know, I grew up with John Einhorn's kid. Like we went to, <laughs> we went to school and played, this is just to give you kind of an idea of like my background. I played lacrosse with, with Jeff Einhorn and John's son. That's funny. That's where we first met. Um, and, and, uh, that's funny. I gotta tell John that. I, yeah. I gotta I gotta check in with him. That cracks me up that he, he's your attorney. I should have known that. Um uh and I know AJ's attorney, Hugh Keefe. Oh, I, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, he's that another one. it's okay. funny. I'm watching I'm watching the Netflix series. I'm like, that's Hugh Keefe. I know I've seen the name. Yeah, I, yeah you kind of see yeah. like uh, and um um McGetrick's another big one because his yeah. he's got the perfect law office. That's right across that's right from across, the courthouse. Yeah. I've known Mike as long <laughs> as I've been in Danbury. He's another he's another he I, guy's like, I actually went into Mike uh when my because I had like uh local cases for it was like a vandalism thing that my community yeah. hit me with and then uh illegal disposition of liquor because they found open bottles of liquor oh, in gosh. the club, yeah. which was just a misdemeanor. And um, he was like, yeah, I can't represent you. There's conflict of interest. Uh, okay. But he was like my first choice yeah. for an attorney. And that's how I ended up with uh, Jeff. And Jeff yeah. was like, yeah, you do not want to go to trial against the feds. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. that, the, most people say that. You know? I mean, everyone says, because it's like, the thing is like with the feds, like they have limitless resources. Yeah. You know, they have like, you know, every like, like federal prosecutor has a team of his own FBI ninjas, <laughs> like on speed dial, you know, and and they have like you know if there's there's was it no my father used to say about dealing with the feds, no turn is left unstoned, you know, with them and and it's just like they and they're also they're famous for sitting on a case for years and don't bring an indictment until they're absolutely thousand percent sure, you know, and they'll watch a they'll watch a guy commit like multiple crimes. Yeah, I've seen that. And and, yeah. and, and just be like, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Okay, I, now get them. Yeah, I mean, some of the individuals we have on the show, like they're, mm -hmm. it's like almost on the line where they're like, they're getting set up to, to a certain extent. It's just, it, it it's pretty crazy. But I've learned and and this experience is you just play ball with them. Mm -hmm. Like they call mm -hmm. me up about restitution. Hey, we need you to pay this. Okay. It's yeah. not, it's not worth fighting it yeah. like at all. Cause you're just going to lose at, at the end of it yeah. and drain resources. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest challenge in the criminal justice system today? Oh gosh. Um, you know, the bail system is always hard. The bail system always is, is something that I, you look at and I feel like, you know, Connecticut has been trying to reform the cash bail system for, and it's gone through many, it's very different than when I first started. Um, and I think they're move. they're trying to move in a positive direction and there's still a lot more, you know, improvement that needs to be done. Um, but it is something where, you know, like, being held on bond, you know, is, is a big deal, you know, whether or not you're able to post bond or, you know, in a lot of ways, that's kind of like one of the most determining factors of your case. Um, cause I remember like in a couple of your, there, there was a guy who you had on, um, I just, I don't remember his first name is the mayor. Yeah, you know, the the I think his last name was Flan Flanagan. Oh, Will Flanagan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was an interesting guy because it was you know it was it was, it was fun, interesting listening to him talk on the perspective between a guy who is um, a prosecutor and a, and a defense attorney. Um, and he, I think you know there were things that he said that that you know were, are pretty accurate, you know, pretty true, or, or or like you know that pretrial detention is used as a way to like you know like you know you'll have someone who will be sitting in in pretrial detention, held on bond, you know, and like in the feds, I think there's even ways in which they can make it so you don't have a bond. Yeah. Um, and because there's not money used in the feds. Yeah. It's just like the signature. Okay. And I think a great example of that is you look at the Michelle Traconis case, which is huge right now mm -hmm. in, in Connecticut, and she is a, a, a conspiracy to commit murder. Mm -hmm. She's been out free for four years. Imagine yeah. if she was sitting inside a detention center. Well, that like be, yeah. most people are for those yeah. kind of charges that don't yeah. have money, I think there would be two entirely different outcomes, which is interesting too. I mean, it's 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 kind of like it's like an expression. Of, it's the ugliest expression of capitalism that we that I can think of in our in our society today, where it's just like you know whoever holds the ability to invest in the you know the, the way of getting someone out, whether it's a and, and it's like it doesn't matter whether it's a million dollar bond 
or like a $10,000 bond. It's whether or not you can make it. It's whether or not you, you have the resources and access the resources to post whatever that bond is. So it's almost like the dollar amount doesn't really matter. It, what matters is whether or not you're able to, to get out. And, and it's like, and if, you know, and, and, you know, it's just, I, I feel like it, it's gross. It's like, you know, someone's access to wealth shouldn't be determinative of the outcome of their case. I just feel I, I don't know how else to better how, how else to say that. Um, that. But you do think we're moving in a better direction. I think Connecticut is. I think because I think there's a lot of people in the legislature who who are sensitive and understand that 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 the the bond the bail system that we have is you know it's not like what it used to be. It, it used to I mean like you used to have like you know like being a bail bondsman in Connecticut. You could you could make a lot of money doing it. I mean, you still kind of can, but there's a lot more ways in which someone who can post a bond with the court can get that money back at the end. You know, at least there's that. You know, but like, um, again, like you know, it's 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 a it's still not. I mean, do I have a good solution to it? No. You know, you know, me being the 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 bad leftist that I am, you know, like the was the you know that you know I I can I think of a better system? Not off the top of my head, but I think that um, that it is that we are trending in the right direction because I think there there is a lot of people who who do want to advocate for you know you know criminal justice reform in that sense, and the the bail system is something that definitely needs to constantly be monitored and looked at and reformed. And, you know, there's always going to be unintended consequences. Um, so, you know, there's like, I remember because they, in New York city, they did bail reform and then everyone got upset because like, Oh, this guy who should have been held on bond and was and was let go and he committed crimes again. And it's, and it's like, I don't know. I mean, you can really rely on what the New York post puts us as, like <laughs> as a headline. A lot of it it's very clickbait. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so, but I, but I think that like, you know, it's better that people, it's better, we're better off when we are making it less about money. You know, I think is, you know, and, and particularly when you're, when you're talking about, um, you know, people's civil rights. What about um, time, like hours in a week? As a public defender, are you working just your normal 40 or is it like uh, as if you're a sole law firm working countless hours uh, on cases? Um, I mean, there's never enough time. You know, and there's always you bring your work home with you in a lot of different ways. Like you watch like again, I think there's like this idea, this this idealized idealized version of like, you know, you see like an attorney like bringing like you know, stacks of files home and, you know, slaving away over like, you know, things. And it's like, is it like that? Like kind of not really, you know, like there's 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 a there's a lot of work that goes into it. You know, there always is and there should be, you know, I mean, like these are people's lives that we're talking about, um, you know, is it, but I think that we have this kind of like romanticized idea of like what, you know, the, like the, the person who like, you know, becomes a martyr almost for their client. Um, and I think that like, you know, you know, do you, you know, do we have to put in extra hours? Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're on trial. You know, like when you're on trial, everything stops. Like, you know, you're like you're you're focusing all only on those things and you're you know, that's when things are at its most intense. Um, but it's also too just getting I mean, that, you know, trial is not a huge part of of the the day to day. Um, you know, it's it's making time to go visit clients who are who are locked up. And, you know, it's getting access to your people, trying to like even sit down and talk to people who aren't locked up. Um, you're trying to, there's only so much time that you can devote to each person um, that it's, you have to, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's just like, you know, it's like you wish you could just stop the clock, you know, and then reach everyone. Um, but a lot of times it's just something as simple as, you have clients who don't have phones. You know, if you have, if your clients are like if you have clients who are like homeless, you know, or or you know, you know, who have like you know, who need help with like services, getting access to medical care, uh, to substance abuse, to mental health illness, 
um, it's like you can work as many hours as you want, as hard as you want, but sometimes you just, it's just like, I, like, I know what this person needs. I know how I want to try and get them connected to services, but those services don't exist. You know, that's like where it gets frustrating. There's, those are, those are things that are just beyond your control that you can't change. Um, or you can do all this stuff that you can to help a person out. And it's just like people who don't have support systems in place, it, it, it again, it's like with the, the social worker was, uh, when she was talking about like, you know, you have people who have every odd stacked against them. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it, that can get, you know, disheartening, you know, because you look at, you, you look at these people and like, there, but by the grace of God, go I, like, what did I do to deserve, you know, to have like, like, like growing up in the household that I grew up in, like, this is something that I'm always constantly like reminding myself of or thinking about, you know, like when I look at people who I've represented or the, the, the people who come through our office, um, you know, and I'm like, man, like, what's there, what's the separation between, like, why did I get to be so lucky? You know, why did I get to be so fortunate to grow up in a household that wasn't surrounded by violence? That um, if I did need to go see a doctor, I had that available. You know, if I did need to uh, go to like, you know, my, you know, I it's growing up, like I was a pain in the ass growing up. Like I wasn't an easy kid to raise. Like I was constantly getting in trouble at school. Um, and, you know, if my parents didn't have resources, it would have been really easy to just shunt me off as being just a bad kid when really, no, I was just some neurodivergent weirdo who just, you know, liked computer games a lot and didn't want to listen to what the nuns told me because I, I went to Catholic school for a period of time. Um, but because I had access to resources, because I had, had access to services, because I had parents who had the wherewithal to get me, you know, to keep an eye on me, um, you know, I didn't, my, my mom didn't have to work. You know, so when I came home from school, there was always someone there for me. These are things that are completely foreign to the people who who come through our through our offices. These are things that like most of the clients who come through our offices statewide, you know, that would be like if I could like only give you 10 percent of what I had growing up, you know, and I just feel like that it's just it. I, you just look at it, I can't help but feel it's like almost like arbitrary. You know, why was this poor person born into these circumstances while I was born into these? And and I feel like thinking about that, given that I was, you know, to quote Spider-Man, <laughs> you know, with great power comes great responsibility, you know? Um, you know, that's, it, I'm more of a Daredevil fan anyways. Because Matt, I never, Mur- I never watched it. Matt Murdock is a public defender. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, his his thing is kind of like his thing is like, oh, I only represent the innocent. I'm like, oh, you know, okay, Matt. <laughs> like, but yeah, that's there's there's a there's a big thing about through the old the old Daredevil comics that and it was one of, he was one of the reasons why he was one of my favorite um, superheroes. Um, you know, and I didn't realize like I didn't look at Daredevil I'm like, oh, I want to be a public defender like Matt Murdock was because that there's different versions of him where he's actually like a fed and like a prosecutor and stuff. And I'm like, ew, <laughs> um, you know, or, um, but it's something, you know, you know, it, it's like, I feel like because I was so lucky that it's incumbent upon, and this is why going back to like, like why I don't think going to art school would have been the better decision for me. Uh, cause if I had gone to art school and just focused on my own art, I'm just taking care of my own needs and my own dreams. But as working with the population that I do, doing the work that I do, um, you know, having come from a background, uh, where I've been given so much, it's incumbent upon me to give back. It's incumbent upon me to help people who weren't so fortunate as I am. Um, that's a lesson that I learned from Tom Ullman. You know, that is something that he really was like, you know, if you, if that was something that I remember him instilling and something that my father used to instill in me too. I mean, my dad grew up in much different circumstances than I did. You know, he grew up with a 
father, like my, like I didn't know my grandfather cause he was an abusive alcoholic. Um, you know, and, and there was, you know, a time where there was like pressure put upon me or expectation put upon me, not by my father, but by other people around me who were like, why aren't you going into practice with your father? Why don't you partner up with him? You know, like, why don't you go do what he does? And I just would always tell him, it was like, I'm where I belong. And no one understood that. Like people always question that about me in my career choices. Um, you know, why would you want to be working in the public defender services when you could be work making, you know, doing very well for yourself, making lots of money, doing personal injury work and doing like, you know, you know, family law and divorces and things like that. Um, you know, and taking over the law practice of my father. Um, and that's always been an option. Like, it's not like Freddie said, no, you got to make it on your own. Like he would, he would have loved it. Nothing would have made him happier if, if, if we could have done leaf and leaf LLP or LLC or whatever. Um, but that just wasn't, that just wasn't my path, you know? And so like when, you know, people still tell me, like, I think you missed your calling. I was like, I think you're wrong. You know, I think I'm where I'm exactly where I need to be. How do you convey to clients this passion you have? Like, how do you build trust with them? Because for me as an individual, I think this is, this is great to know that my public defender, that my attorney is so passionate and cares so much about his clients I feel like that's a that's a big part of your job, getting people to trust you in that sense. I think it's not that difficult to just be kind. To like it, like it's not. There's no trick to being compassionate, other than just being compassionate. Like there is a lot of immigrant people. There's a there's a large immigrant population in this jurisdiction. I mean, there's a large immigrant population everywhere you go, but in particular, there's a lot of Portuguese speaking people in this area, and there's a lot of Spanish speaking people in this area who come through our office and. I'm doing my best, like just so, just something as simple as saying hello, how are you in someone's native language immediately makes them feel seen. Like if you can figure out ways to make your client feel seen and feel heard, um, I don't think that's that, I don't, for me, I don't find that to be too difficult. I, I think that um, if you, the key is, and and I'm not like unique in this respect. This isn't something that like I've figured out the process to. I, I I feel this way because I learned it from people. I learned it from people in Tom Ullman's office. I learned it from, you know, attorneys that I've worked with in the office that I work with. When I look at, you know, um, you know, other attorneys like throughout my entire career growing up, uh, you want to make sure that you're, it, it should be a priority, at least in my eyes, that your client feels like that they're a, a worthy human being, you know, at least in their attorney's eyes. Um, you know, and, and I think that's something where, you know, there, there's, we, we think about it as being some sort of like, you know, mystical kind of like secret, but it's not. It's like, you know, I, I tell my son, be kind, you know, it's cost you nothing. You know, saying thank you, saying please, you know, something as simple as, you know, asking your client, how are you doing, you know, outside of all of this, you know, and tell them it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to like, you know, it's okay that like if, if things are like not good for you and you're emotionally not in a place where you feel like, you know, safe and secure, like it's okay to express that here. And if that is the case, what can I do to help you? What can I do to help you? Because it's like, like, you know, how can I holistically treat the client? How can I um, make sure that my clients, not just their legal needs are met, but if there are some sort of, you know, emotional needs that they have, you know, and a lot of people would roll their eyes hearing me say stuff like this, but that's just like, you know, I, that's the only way I know how to do the job is that it's most important that you treat the human. You know, because they're not a docket number. They're not a charge. They're not the accused. They're not the defendant. You know, I used to have this idea of like, you know, it's just me and my client um, versus the world. And it's like, sure, that is an aspect of it. But it's more important that your client is not a prop. Your client is not um, someone that is um, there to make you feel good about what you're doing. Like my feelings in the case are irrelevant. 
what I'm trying to do is make sure that my client is treated with human humanity and dignity, you know, and, and the way in which you get around those, like, you know, the stereotypes of whatever, um, you know, if you're doing it to dismantle the stereotype, I think you're, you're not coming from an honest place. I think you should be coming from it as, as in who cares what the stereotype is. I don't care about how people view public defender work um, or people who have the career that I have. What I care about is the person that I'm standing, I'm sitting with and talking about this case with. How do I make that person feel like, like they're a whole human being in my eyes? You know, and, and how can I make that person appear as a whole human being in the system's eyes? Because the system is a, a meat grinder. You know, it's just really, you know, and it's, and it's, and it's like, you know, it's a system that once you get locked into it, it's, you know, locked in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see what we did there. What, um, um, what advice would you give to uh, someone that's, you know, making a career out of law, like a, a young college student or that's considering it or even someone that's in law school now? It's not too late to change your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I think like, um, I mean, it's so cliche to like find something that you're passionate about because to some people, you know, I te I just started teaching a, co a course over at University of New Haven and there's, um, you know, there's a lot of kids who are like thinking about going to law school and they're always, they're very curious and they're asking me about the practice, uh, you know, being a practitioner or whatnot. And like, I'm like, well, why do you want to go to law school? And this one student said to me, he's like, cause I want to make a lot of money. And I was like. <laughs> Valid. <laughs> like if that's what your goal is, if that's what you, if that's, if, if, if you think that that's what you're, you know, like, again, I'm not here to make your choices. I'm only here to support them. Um, you know, I think like, you know, when I, cause if I were speaking to one L Thomas Leaf, who thinks that he's going to go on to become like my, I was like, I want to go, I want to be in the U S attorney's office. You know, I want to be a federal prosecutor. Um, me today to that person be like, look, man, if that's your path, walk it. You know, if that's the path that you want to walk, walk it. But just make sure you can do it with your head held up. You know, it's like I tell my son all the time, if you tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. Um, you know, I think that like, you know, you know, people, you know, whatever path that you're going to walk, you have to make sure that you're doing it for yourself. You know, that you are intrinsically motivated to being like, this is this is the person that I want to be in the community in which I live. And and if you're, you know, and hopefully you can do that with compassion. You know, you can do it with kindness. You can do it with empathy. Even if your goal is to just get out there and make paper, you know, if that's what you want to do, okay, well, just don't be a jerk about it then. You know, don't do it where you're exploiting other people, you know, and, and it's like, you know, the, the legal, the legal profession is, is a weird one because there's a lot of theater in the legal profession. There's a lot of like, you know, when I was in private practice, one of the things that I was kind of like, you know, realizing is that it's important to look as a private attorney it's really important to not just be a good lawyer, but to look like a good lawyer, right? Like, you know, like what you wear matters when you do client intakes as a private attorney. Um, how you, you know, the, the office space that you keep, like there is like theater, you know, to that where like, it's all like, you know, it's all, it's all just that. It's just to like, you're selling an image to a client because you're hoping that they're going to retain you for whatever case that they have that they're bringing you. Cause you know, and, and that's an aspect to the profession that I just, I'm not good at. I'm not like, that's not where my head's at. That's not what I'm interested in. Um, which is why I think that's why if I wasn't, a, if I wasn't working, you know, for representing indigent clients or working, doing public defender work, I wouldn't be a lawyer. You know, I'd be doing, I would be making comic books. <laughs> you know, I would it's be where life takes <laughs> yeah, us. You know, I would be, um, so like, you know, I, I think that I just spent a lot of time completely not answering your question. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I, I, I think that was a good, so that gives people the idea. Now, something we were, you know, touching on earlier in the conversation, um, that there is this world now of these 
prison influencers, people that are um, talking about their recovery and mm-hmm. addiction, and mm-hmm. they have hundreds of thousands of followers, millions of followers. Mm-hmm. They're building these platforms, and the world is kind of taking that in, like brands, do we work with these individuals, mm-hmm. and just this new level of influencing that the world's never seen before, and, and individuals like myself too. Mm-hmm. As someone that's in this legal system, how can we use platforms like this to make changes? In, in the world, in the world, now that we have so much power in these voices, yeah, it's a, it's, oh, it, you know, it's it's something where I'm a, I'm a Gen X kid, so the influencer like economy is something that happened way after I graduated from college and and even law school. So excuse me, but um. So the idea of even having like, quote unquote, a platform, just me as like an individual, like, like the fact that like, I, when I was watching like your YouTube channel, I was like, dude, there's like almost 300,000 people subscribed to this channel. Like there's like, you know, I, I watched a video last night, um, kind of like getting like, you know, <laughs> get, get ready. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, I'm like, and, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my Jesus Christ, 30, 60,000 people watched this in the last month. Like pe- that many people are going to listen to f- like. And then we have the whole audio, Spotify, Apple, all those listeners too. Uh, my my anxiety is going to the roof. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's like I, like I get up in front of strangers and I talk in front of strangers for a living, you know, like, um, you know, and yet, you know, it, it's to me the, the idea of putting yourself in a position where you have so many eyes on you. Um, is terrifying to me. Uh, you know, it, it's something where where it, it's it's a very vulnerable position, but it also is a position where you are very um, you reach so many people, and I think like when you like was it like oh uh, you know like like the idea today of like my son right the idea of being like okay your favorite show is on but you have to wait until Thursday at seven o'clock to watch it is like, what are you talking about? I just want to, I can't, I just, it's on max. It's on Netflix. It's on Amazon. I want to watch it right now. So like the, I think they used to call that like what linear television or linear, like, you know, or like terrestrial radio and like all these old, old forms of media that I grew up used to. They were like, like there was, there was a lack of access there. Like the idea like, like, uh, like I was telling you when we first started, sat down and talked about like, you know, the, my friends who stream on Twitch, mm-hmm. they started with a cable access TV show. And like, there is like a barrier to entry at, with that. Like, you know, like now you can do all this stuff. You can put all this stuff together. You can create a platform. You can, you know, you get the equipment like here, like what you've done. Um, and, and I think that you can like that barrier to entry is so much lower now. And, and, you know, like, what can you do? Well, you can have, you like, you can have on as many people who can tell their stories as much as possible to, to remind people that these are human beings that we're talking about, that, you know, this isn't like, you know, that, 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 um, you know, that you, like, cause there are people out there who are doing it for clout, you know? And if I thought you were one of those people, I wouldn't be here. You know, I wouldn't want to be like, I wouldn't want to be a part of that. Um, but like, if you're, you know, the, it's, it's an amazingly a democratized sort of way in which someone can create not just an audience, um, but a platform, but a thesis statement. Like, what is your thesis statement in terms of like, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you saying out to do? And if, you know, for, for locked in and you're, you know, like what you want to do, um, you know, you want to, you know, change the way people view, you know, convict people with convictions. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing. You know, I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's very necessary because growing up, the only media that I was exposed to is that people who have convictions are bad people. That people who got arrested, um, their circumstances, what led them to that, to whatever got them arrested, um, irrespective of whether or not they were wrongfully arrested versus, you know, arrested because they actually did do something wrong. Like, like I was raised with this belief through the media that these are bad people. 
you know, that these are not like that you're, they're different than you. You like, you know, like they're gross, they're dirty, they're criminals. Um, but I think now that the barrier to entry to creating like social media influencer platforms to get out and reach other people um, can really dismantle and dismiss a lot of those narratives. Um, you know, because why were those narratives um, created in the first place? Because they sold ad money. You know, because it's like, you know, I'm trying to think of like. Um, well, you know, also these people wouldn't give them a voice. Yeah. Like if I call the local newspaper, which I've done in the past and say, hey, can we do a follow up article? They don't give me the time of day. Yeah. No, I mean, I, you know. But I, when one of my clips goes viral, that article from five years ago is the number one yeah. clip on their news site because people are searching the name. So mm -hmm. I think this creates you're giving a voice to the voiceless, which mm -hmm. is like a reoccurring theme. And I don't, I, I don't know if the world was ready for that yet. Like they, like it's good, but there's this now this added pressure because what something I've noticed too is like if I reach out to politicians or trying to get involved in my community, mm -hmm. they're kind of like it's not so as much easy to say no because now you have this platform mm -hmm. where someone can make a TikTok mm -hmm. where it's like says, well, I tried to do the right thing and this person didn't do that and it just puts a spotlight on them. So yeah. I think it, it, it puts some pressure on on the situation. That's it should because your your audience and a lot of times if you're talking about people who are in public office, these are your constituents. Mm -hmm. You know, that there's the this isn't a Venn diet like this is a Venn diagram. There's there's overlap here. Where the people who are turn, tuning in to watch your shows, um, you know, are oftentimes the same people who, you know, people in the legislature also represent, you know, I mean, they're, you know, and, and I think that like, you know, as they're, you know, if you're talking about politicians, you know, and they see that, you know, their constituencies are changing, their views are changing. You're supposed to be responsive to that, right? Like you're supposed to like ostensibly in a representative democracy, the people that you elect are supposed to represent what you as you know, like you're like, you know, I don't know if you want to say like they almost work for you, but that's what they're supposed to do. You know, is that is, you know, it, it and I think that like, you know, these, you know, influencers or these people who are in the position you have, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with it, too. Um, and if you and if you don't handle it well, if you abuse, you know, the 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 power that comes along with having a large platform. Um, that will turn around and bite you back too. You know, I mean, like, you know, it's, you know, along with like, like social media is like scary to me because it's like, it, it you know, it's like watching people get canceled. is like yeah. rough, you know, like there's. It's I'm grateful know, all my dirty laundry's out there. Yeah. Anything bad someone wants to see about <laughs> me, guess what? It's on Google from almost yeah. 10 years ago now. Um, but it is scary. Like you, you have to be very careful, which is why I'm, I'm sure people, professionals like yourself could be hesitant to come on a show like this mm -hmm. um, too. And I get that aspect of it too. But I think it also goes back to give someone a chance, get to know them, mm -hmm. have a conversation before just writing someone off because of their past. Because you you got to watch some of the episodes and you yeah. realized quickly that it's not that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there like in the influencer space, there are grifters everywhere. I mean, like grifter has become like a word that was never mentioned when I was younger. To now, it's like <laughs> like a very specific person. Like you know, when I say grifter, there's all there's a there's a certain face that pops into our head. You know, you you mention that word. You Every know, because, Netflix uh, fraud story, yeah, that uses the word uh, yeah. grifter. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, like there's like um, and and uh, and it's something where it as of uh, when you put yourself out there, it's it's vulnerable. It's you know, like I'm sticking my chin out for someone to take a swing at it, you know, because, um, but at the same time, like you know, you have to be willing to have the courage of your convictions, you know, and I I should be able to. Get sit in this chair and tell you what I feel. Uh, you know, if I if I can't do that, I don't know. What does that say about me? You know, like what does that say about like you know like you know and and you know are there repercussions to this? I don't. I mean, I don't think I've said anything too crazy. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't think I've said anything that's like way out of line, other than just be like, look, man, don't be a jerk. You know, like yeah. help people. Like you know, if you're if you're 
if you're like someone like me who was born into a life of privilege, like use that privilege to help people who don't, don't have it. Like how hard is that? Yeah. Like how difficult is that? Like, you know, like do you, like it, it's, it doesn't have to be all about me. Um, you know, it, it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be at some point, it's gotta be bigger than that. Now in a, in a world where, and we were touching on this earlier, uh, in a world where there's so many people that are, have been incarcerated and are coming out into the world mm -hmm. that are, are frowned upon, that are not looked at as mm -hmm. a normal human being, how do we change the stigma around giving someone a second chance? Um, yeah. I think it's, it's culturally, you know, like, like if you look at the way other people, other countries do criminal, their criminal justice system and compare it to the way nationwide we do it in the United States. Um, and it's in some ways, you know, like there are other systems that are like super brutal, like, you know, that kid who got caned because he spit on the sidewalk in Singapore. Right. But there's also a kid who is a school shooter who killed, I think like 50, uh, I forget is it the kid from Finland who like killed like 50 kids at a, at a school outing. Right. Um, he's getting released like in a, in a year or two, like if not already, because the, the maximum sentence that you can get in Scandinavian countries is 20 years. And you ask, you know, these Scandinavian countries, whether it's Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, uh, you ask them, why would you, why do you do this? And when I've seen people from those systems speak on it, and it's like, how can you expect someone to be a better version of themselves if you don't give them any hope? The, you know, if the maximum sentence that you can receive for the most, the most horrible crimes that you can commit is capped at this number of years, which is half of what you can get in Connecticut for murdering one person, this guy is getting half that, and he murdered in cold blood, like said some horrible things, did, it, was like, it was a hate crime. He gets out in 20, and it's like even someone who did something as terrible as that kid, um, if you don't give them any hope of like if you're, the rest of your life is going to be spent in the system, then you have no incentive to change. Uh, and I think that like what I would like to see is a, is a system where um, we are incentivizing people to be their best selves. Um, and I think that, you know, in some ways we're striving towards that and other ways we're lagging behind. But, um, but if you can incentivize, you know, like the way, you, you know, an incentive is like a, in some, some, some circumstances, a dirty word. Uh, but it's kind of like, look, if we're going to be in a free market society, you know, if this is going to be, you know, th th that's what we adhere to is our, in, in terms of our belief, we're going to monetize everything. You know, you, you have to incentivize certain behaviors. I mean, that's the whole purpose behind like, you know, laws. Like, you know, laws aren't there to prevent crime. Laws are there to inform you. What do you do when the crime's been com been committed? And, and if you're going to make the punishment so harsh uh, that a person has no incentive to do anything because they're just being told, you know, you're going to be in the system, you're going to be trapped in the system forever for your entire life. What incentive does that person have to, to do better or be better or make different decisions? Um, but you also have to, again, it goes back to access to resources. You know, I remember like people used to like when before cannabis was legalized in most states, people used to hold up places like the Netherlands and Portugal for decriminalizing possession of, of recreational drugs. And it's like, yeah, it worked. Like in those states, it really worked really well. Recidivism went down. Um, relapses went down. HIV transmission rates went down. Because all because they weren't criminalizing you know a disease such as addiction, but what they also did was made sure that those people had access to services like housing, right? Like if you want to really change the way things are going, to, something as simple as having access to housing is one of the most determinative factors as to whether or not someone recidivates. Um, if because if you're homeless and you don't have access to resources or a support system when things are when times are bad. Like it's hard enough getting clean and sober as it is when you've got friends and family who care about you. Now take that away. Try and get clean and sober then. 
And it's like, try and get clean and sober because, you know, and, and, and just by saying to someone, well, if you don't, you're going to go back to prison. That's not, that's not the motivation. Like that's not going to help someone get to a place where they can be their, their fullest best self, you know? And, and some people would say, well, is it the purpose of the criminal justice system to, um, to, to help people become their, their best selves? And I would say, look, if you, if you believe in rehabilitation, yes, yes, absolutely. Like, you know, like we, we want people, we want everyone to be able, like, like this isn't a zero sum game. This isn't like, you know, I, if, if this person has a slice of the pie, somehow that takes away from mine. No, like this is something where people should be able to be given a chance to be the person that they, you know, that their parents hoped that they could become when they were born. You know, when you look at, when you look at a young kid and you think about all the promise and potential in that young person, um, everyone, no matter how badly you've behaved or whatever choices you made, whatever you've done, um, should be given the opportunity to at least try and get back to that. You know, like, you know, I don't know if that's, that's cheesy or if that is like, you know, a little too saccharine or whatever. Maybe I'm just a bedwetting liberal who's <laughs> completely like, you know, uh, has no, um, you know, uh, who's my head, head's in the cloud. But it's like when you look at like one of the things that I get frustrated, you know, when you see like the way in which like particularly drug laws and how we go about, you know, enforcing them. Um, one of the things that is incentivized to do is to get people to snitch, you know, and get, and it's like you, and all you're doing is getting poor people to turn on poor people. Like, that's just gross to me. Like, that is just like, you're like, like you're trying to get people to like, you know, it's like intra-class warfare, you know, it, it, it and, and, you know, I don't know, it, something about that just doesn't feel right. And it's not solving the the bigger issues at hand. No, it just adds fuel to the fire. Yeah, it's just like you know when you have a when you have someone in law enforcement who arrests someone who they know is a, who's got a drug problem, and like, hey man, I'll let you out. I'll give you a PTA if you like you know do work for me. Of course, that person's going to say yes. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like when really it's just like no, we need to get that person connected to services so that they can like you know get treatment, get clinical care, get aftercare, and get connected with a place to live. You know, that's how you break that cycle, you know, like that. And, and, and that's what people, you know, people deserve that. Like people deserve to have that. You know, it's like if you're going to live in a pluralistic democracy like we ostensibly do, um, we should be striving to take care of the people who are not born with, you know, born into places of like, you know, privilege, like someone like, like I was. Absolutely. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, I, we have a one more question for you for our YouTube membership program. Those yeah. that are uh, listening on, you know, Spotify, Apple, make sure you guys subscribe on our YouTube membership page. <laughs>